Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of FitRx. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis. Um, if you've listened to my podcast in the past year, you've heard me uh, talk about maybe uh, uh, mostly a meat-based diet. And so I've actually advocated for that a lot rather than what a lot of people say uh, a plant-based diet is more healthy. And I've, I've always said, well, you should base most of your calories on uh, animal sources, uh, specifically beef. And I've had Dr. Sean Baker on here last year about the carnivore diet, um, which is nothing but animal products. And so we're going to revisit that today. And so if you think I'm crazy and don't take my word for it, because I'm just a lowly, uh, family practice doctor, then how about hearing it from a neurosurgeon? And so, um, today we are going to talk to Dr. Anthony Chafee. Uh, he is a uh, neurosurgical resident uh, in Australia, um, previous uh, uh, professional rugby player, I believe, and so um, was an athlete. So interested to see how he got into all this. And so uh, we will talk about that. So Dr. Chafee, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. How are you? Doing great. So um, tell us, I guess, just first, Kind of a little bit about you so you have a history of being an athlete and so when did your interest in maybe nutrition started and when did was it was it about the time of medical school or just kind of talk to us about when you got an interest in all that well yeah i mean the you know, because i played you know as high level of sports as i could from from an early age i was always interested in you know making sure that my my body was fueled in in the correct way you know i noticed that you know eating different things at different times made me feel better or worse and so because i was interested in medicine and biology as well i just naturally took an interest in in nutrition as well and and you know for my own sake as well as just you know general knowledge and i got um you know, I was, I was getting new, doing the normal nutrition courses, learning the normal traditional sort of things. Uh, when that was, uh, when I was sort of a late teenager, the Atkins diet, you know, became, uh, you know, had a resurgence and people were talking about, you know, getting rid of carbohydrates and so forth for losing fat. Um, but for me, it, it really kicked off when I was taking cancer biology uh, in my undergraduate degree at the university of Washington in Seattle, when we were, we were, you know, discussing, you know, cancer and so forth, but we were talking about plants and the things that we eat and that, you know, plants, natural deterrent is to use poisons to deter animals from eating. They have different, different defenses as well, but that's a major, uh, that's a major defense. Um, and so we were looking at this from a cancer perspective and we learned day one that Brussels sprouts had 136 identified carcinogens in them that, you know, white table mushrooms had over 100. And they were given sheets with all the different sort of vegetables that you'd ever eat or anything you'd find at a store. And they had a, a number next to them and the number of known or identified thus far uh, carcinogens. Not a single one had under 60. We were very taken aback by this. We obviously, everything that we've always been told is vegetables are, are good for you. Vegetables are great for you. You have to eat your vegetables, even though they taste bitter and we don't like them, which I think you know should be a, uh, a hint for everybody because if something has a bitter taste, you know, that's your tongue and your brain telling you that there's something in there that you don't want and you naturally spit it out. That's how nature works. It's natural. If it, if it tastes bad, it, pro it probably has something that, you know, isn't good for you. Um, so we were taken aback by this. We thought that he, he must be joking because everyone was just literally, literally looking around wildly, looking for a TA or something like that, smirking in the corner, you know, to give up the joke, but you know, we didn't see any of that. And all of a sudden I, you know, I realized that he was serious and I remember thinking in my head, you know, but but vegetables are still good for you though. Right. And he just looked at us and he just very calmly just looked at us and said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And I just said, okay, screw plants. And I went to the grocery store and you know, everything was a plant. Everything had plants in it, you know, you know grains and salads, obviously the produce aisle, but any packaged food, had some sort of plant added to it, uh, be it vegetables, grains, or what have you. And so I just started walking around and I, I found, I was like, okay, well, eggs, eggs don't have, don't come from a plant, like milk, milk doesn't come from a plant, meat, meat doesn't come from a plant. So I ate eggs, meat, and milk for the next sort of five years. 
you know, doing a basically a pure carnivore diet with the inclusion of, of some dairy every now and then without, without really realizing what I was doing, I was just not eating plants because I knew plants were trying to kill me. I was playing professional rugby at the time. Um, I was in, you know, in, in university and, uh, going to class in the mornings. Then I'd be training from three o'clock till about 10 o'clock every single day. And then have games, sometimes two or three games on the weekend because I you know, played for the university. I played for my men's team and I would try to you know, get extra games. because I just wanted to play, 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 play. And I, you know, I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't get tired. I, I didn't get sore anymore. Uh, that's something I notice now as well is that, you know, when I eat, you know, I get some sort of plant material in, maybe a bit of rice will mix it. I mean, I mean like a bit of rice, like half a piece every now and then if I'm stuck to a couple pieces of meat, I'll be sore or one cup of coffee, I'll be sore from working out for two days after that. And so it's a, it's a natural deterrent. You know, I, I feel bad when I eat these things. I don't want to eat these things. At the time, I didn't realize how significant what I was doing was. So when I was, I was in England playing uh, professionally, I, I sort of slipped off of it because, you know, some of the meat that I, I was getting was breaded and, um, you know, did, I had just different access to food over there. And and so I was thinking, it was like, well, you know, is it, is it that big a deal? Obviously the breading is, you know, from a plant, I don't want that, but is it that big of a deal? You know, dose makes a poison and so forth. Uh, it made a big difference. I remember a few months in thinking to myself, well, why don't I feel as just, you know, superhuman as I normally do? Am I just not training as hard? Am I, you know, I was 25 at the time. I was like, is that it? Am I over a hump? And I'm just going to you know, just start dying from here. And I didn't, I didn't really figure it out, but I I'd sort of slipped off of that and I'd started incorporating plants again. And then there was just this big push, this big plant-based push after that. And everyone just, oh, you have to eat plants. You have to eat plants. You know, the Gomes diet, you know, came out with, um, uh, with Dr. Furman and, um, and he was, you know, pushing it saying, oh, you have to eat you know, mushrooms and so forth because they have anti-VEGF and that's good against cancer. And I was thinking, I was like, well, it may have something good in it that you want, but it's also got hundreds of things that you don't want. So I was, I was thinking the last kind of, you know, cherry picking and also, you know, anti-VEGF is good for cancer. Great. I don't have cancer, you know, like why would I need to take chemo? And, you know, it has a hundred agents that can cause cancer. So, you know, what are we, what are we really doing here? And so I, I didn't really find those as great arguments. But there was just such a this just push all the time that I just started slipping these things back in because I hadn't really thought about it. I hadn't thought about how significant what I was doing was, and I just sort of slipped off of it. And then I actually came across um, Dr. Baker's podcast on Joe Rogan uh, several years ago, and you know I just sort of looked at that, and, and everything sort of slotted into place. And um, you know, my brother said like, "Well, there, there's this guy. He's a doctor. He was a rugby player." And he, he only eats meat. He said, you can get all your nutrition from meat. And obviously at first I thought like, well, well, that doesn't sound right. But at the same time, I basically did that for five years. And every few months I thought to myself, I was like, you know, do I need vitamins? Should I eat a banana or something? But, you know, I thought that I was feeling great and my gums weren't bleeding. So I just decided to keep going with it. And within five minutes of, of watching him on that podcast, I realized that he was, you know, he, he was really onto something and that it probably was more right than he knew at the time, because I had seen a lot of different, different reasons. Obviously I knew about, you know, the plants containing harmful chemicals and harmful components. Um, and also I knew uh, about the, the research coming out of UCSF uh, with Dr. Robert Lustig about showing that fructose was actually, uh, you know, a causative factor in a lot of different diseases. And, and instead of, cholesterol causing heart disease and diabetes and everything else it's blamed for. It was really fructose was looking like the culprit and, you know, all the big studies after 2015 showing that, you know, we really had uh, the idea of cholesterol backwards. Um, and so all these things sort of slotted into place. And I really just started digging into the research at that point. So that, at that, at that time was when I really, really started just digging into the research and the literature to find out exactly what we knew and what we could prove. Let me ask a, a couple of things about what you said. So um, you talked about the, um, the the defense mechanism in plants, yes. and and so I think um, even most vegetarians who are educated will admit to that and agree that plants have some harmful chemicals in it. Um, yeah. But they will say, well, something called xenohormesis, which is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And so that, mm. uh, you know, your body will will take those harmful chemicals and that 
you know, like resveratrol, different, you know, different things that are supposedly healthy and your body will become uh, stronger for it. So I guess what's your argument for that it, it, with this concept that, that many people call xenohormesis? I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, it's certainly possible, but, you know, they, I don't, I haven't seen any like hard evidence. I mean, you, you can, you can assert that. Well, maybe this does that, but you know, what's, what's the evidence for it? Um, you know, at a certain point, cyanide is going to kill you. It just is. And, you know, and, and almond, and it's just 3,500 different plants that use cyanide and almonds being one of them. And so, you know, you get about, you know, one to two is varying amounts of cyanide in an almond, but about one to two pounds of almonds is a lethal dose of cyanide in an adult. Okay. And so I don't, I don't see how that's really helping you. If you get a lethal dose of cyanide, nightshades are another thing that we've known for millennia. That these are harmful, you know, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, tobacco, you know, belladonna, these things are toxic and we've known this. And then when we came back from the new world, we brought these nightshades over. Everyone knew you don't eat these things. They're nightshades. Uh, and they were, they were the table decorations. They were, uh, the plants were brought back as curiosities because they were, they were interesting. The tomato plant is a pretty crazy looking plant if you think about it. And so they brought these things back as a novelty. Um, and then they, you know, started eating them in different ways, but they did it. They, they didn't just eat the whole plant. They, uh, they waited till they were vine ripened. That makes a big difference. There's studies showing that, that like green tomatoes have, is, you have sort of folk wisdom that, um, you know, green tomatoes are, are poisonous and you have to wait till they ripen. And then people say, oh, well, that's, that's just, um, you know, that's just, uh, you know, folklore, but it actually is based in reality. When it's, when the uh, fruit is green, the seed is, is immature and it's not going to be able to, to, you know, make a plant. And so they want to protect that seed. They don't want you to eat it until it's uh, ripe. And so it has a lot more poison when it's vine ripened, it gets rid of I think most of those, a lot of those, but when you, when you, you know, crate ripen them, if you pick them early and let them ripen in a bet in a box, they don't. And so, and then the skin, that's their barrier protection. So that's where there's a higher concentration of poison. Seeds have a higher concentration of poison as well, because that's, that's what the plant is trying to protect the most. That's the plant's baby. So that's where you generally find the highest concentration of poison. So, you know, early Italians and Spanish um, who actually started eating these things would, would vine ripen them blanch them in boiling water, take the skin off and then take all the seeds out and they would just use the pulp. Now we just use the whole thing. They say, oh, well, the skin's the most important part. It has most of the vitamins. Yeah, well, it has most of the poison as well. Um, you know, as far as, as these things go, you say, well, they have some poisonous things, but they'll probably make you stronger. How many people have died in the woods from eating the wrong plant? You know, if you get lost out in the woods and you don't know exactly what to eat and you run out of food, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You can't just eat any random plant. Mm -hmm. You know, most of them will kill you or at least make you very, very sick. Um, so, you know, the, the thing with, um, with plants is that that's their main defense. You know, they're living organisms. They don't want to die. If you eat them, they die. Mm -hmm. There are some symbiotic sort of relationships, um, but a lot of, but, but that's, that those are very specific between plant and animal. And so if the wrong animal is eating these plants, that doesn't help the plant out. And so they want to be, they don't want to be eaten by that animal. Um, so everything has a defense while plant, you know, while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. So they have a bunch of different things like trees are tall, they grow up, their leaves are out of the way, things can't get them on the ground, things are out of the way, they have spikes, they have different sorts of, you know, um, you know, mimicking ability to look like something that, you know, maybe a bug doesn't want to eat or lay eggs on and so forth. But they all, almost all, all that I know of use some sort of chemical deterrent. And so, and I, I even learned this in seventh grade biology, I, I, you may, may have as well that, you know, plants and animals are an evolutionary arms race, plants becoming more and more poisonous. So less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And that animals becoming more and more adapted to specific plants so they can eat them and nothing can't, that's their dedicated food source. They don't have to compete for resources. And so if you sort of break out of that and you, come out of that evolutionary arms race, you know, these things are going to get more and more poisonous in respect to you. So, you know, it's very obvious that not all plants being, you know, are, are going to be provide a benefit of for us by being poisonous. You know, most of them will kill you. Most of the, most plants will kill most animals, you know, like even strict herbivores, they eat, you know, one or two plants, you know, koalas eat 
eucalyptus. They don't need anything else. And almost nothing else eats eucalyptus and so forth. So, you know, if you haven't evolved to eat a plant, that plant is bad for you. So I think it's, I think it's nice that they came up with that theory that, that sort of defends their, their ideology, but I don't think the, that the evidence really backs it up. Gotcha. I also want to go back uh, because you started doing all this when you were still an athlete. Mm. Um, and even though I'm primarily meat based, I'm not strict carnivore and, you know, I like to work out. And so people say, well, if you're going to eat carbohydrates, you know, do it like right after workout. So your body can, mm. can utilize that. You can get that, um, that glucose, you know, into the muscles, the insulin, you get a quick insulin rise. So what's your thought on that? I mean, it doesn't sound like you felt like you needed that when you were younger and an athlete, but, and, and what, what, what about now? I mean, do you, do you, I'm assuming you look like you still work out. I mean, do you feel like you need any carbohydrates like after a workout? No, I, I feel the, the exact opposite, actually. You know, when, when I dropped carbohydrates, I, I, I felt like I had unlimited energy hmm. and now that I know what I'm, I'm doing and I know why what I'm doing is, is effective. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've gone back to working out so far. I, I feel absolutely fantastic. I feel as good as I did when I was in my early twenties, you know, play professionally on this diet. I feel better than in my late twenties when I wasn't on this diet, still playing professionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my body just works a lot better and, um, carbohydrates, I think that they're probably one of the first things that, that people should take out of their system. You know, sugar and, and carbohydrates are probably the worst, I think. Um, you know, when people are sort of talking about, you know, what things to cut out, they don't want to go like full carnivore or whatever. I, I generally recommend, okay, we'll just get rid of sugar and carbs first and then maybe nightshades and just sort of see where you're at. Maybe try to eat more meat if you can, but I think those are the big ones. Um, you know, I argue that, that, you know, the so-called fed state and fasting state in biochemistry that we, we describe, I think that's not accurate. I think that our so-called fasting state is actually our primary metabolic state. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. That's the primary metabolic state of, of animals in the wild. Um, there's studies with wolves going back to 1981, looking at like, well, you know, the thought was that you had to eat carbs to burn carbs. So, you know, wolves don't carbo low before they chase caribou for 10 hours in the Arctic North. You know, what do they have blood sugar? Do they have glycogen? And they found out that yes, they do, but it, it's rock solid. It doesn't change because their body is, is constantly uh, replenishing it. And so, you know, their liver glycogen may be a lot lower than what you'd see in, a, you know, carbo loaded athlete, but it stays rock solid. They're, 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 they're constantly regenerating that from their adipose tissue. And so they're using this stuff on the fly, but they're rebuilding. So they have an unlimited supply basically because uh, they're just constantly regenerating it. Whereas, uh, you know, carbo loaded athlete has a lot of glycogen, but eventually that's going to run out because when you eat carbohydrates, your blood sugar goes up mm -hmm. and this is actually toxic. You know, this is what, what kills diabetics. So that just that high blood sugar, you know, causes glycation, oxidative stress, so forth that, that damages your body internally. And so I believe in it in defensively, we raise up our insulin be in, in that defensive mechanism to try to get that down and, uh, and, you know, protect the body. Well, you know, insulin obviously forces energy into cells, it block, but it doesn't allow it out of cells. It blocks lipolysis, it blocks proteolysis. And so it's, it makes it so all the fat that you have in your body is now, you know, shut off. Um, so now you can't access it and your insulin stays up for you know, roughly 24 hours and you can't, you can't access your fat stores in that time. So that's, that's a real hindrance for a high performance athlete, because now you're limited by the carbohydrates that you've eaten and continue to eat. Um, and it also causes you to overeat as well because your blood sugar is dropping, you feel like crap. And then it also blocks leptin, you know, which, you know, send off from your adipose tissue and tell your brain how much energy you have. And so now your brain thinks that you don't have a lot of leptin, that you don't have a lot of fat stores and your blood sugar is dropping. So it sends panic signals saying you have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat. And so people tend to overeat. Um, you know, I've always thought about this, you know, you know, people talk about hitting, you know, working out until you hit the wall and, you know, most people, you know, get to the point they, they hit the wall and they just run out of energy. And I, I can't work out anymore. Most people stop at that point, but a lot of athletes, especially like distance runners or, you know, high performance athletes, you know, they push and they push and they push and they say, well, if you push, you keep pushing, you'll eventually break through the wall and then you'll have a runner's high. You'll be able to just go forever and you'll just feel great. You get your second win. And 
I think of that biochemically as you're in a carbohydrate insulin driven state and you, you have a limited amount of, of glycogen that you're running on. And eventually you run out of that. And all of a sudden you hit that wall, your blood sugar is dropping, you run out of glycogen, but your insulin's up. So you can't access your adipose tissue and you feel like, like absolute misery. But if you keep pushing, you keep pushing, keep pushing, you can, you can drive your, your metabolism back into its normal state, so-called fasting state. And, and uh, all of a sudden you'll be able to start accessing your fat stores and you'll be able to just run how you normally would. And that's your second win. You can go forever where, you know, when I'm in, when I'm doing carnivore or, or at least not eating carbohydrates, you know, I'm always in that state. I'm in a perpetual uh, second win. I'm in a perpetual uh, runner's high. So when I exercise, I produce the energy that my body needs for that exercise. And when we, you know, why we take stimulants is because they make you burn more energy. It makes us feel good when you burn more energy. And so I feel better when I work out because I'm going to produce more energy. I'm going to burn more energy and I feel better when I do. And so it's this positive feedback, the harder I work, the better I feel. And so I just, I want to work out more and more and more. And, and as a, you know, a uh, rugby player, I was, I just, I just couldn't get tired. And I just loved, I just pushed myself so hard and I just felt better and better when I did. So, you know, I, I, you know, try to tell, you know, I, I've definitely heard people, especially like in the ketogenic realm say that, oh, if you're a high performance athlete, that, yeah, you really do need to eat carbohydrates. I completely disagree with that. I think that you're much better off if you don't, because you're going to be able to access these, this energy much, much better. Yeah. And in my experience, that's probably if, if somebody is used to eating a lot of carbohydrates and they're an athlete and they switch over to keto or something like carnivore, I mean, it's going to take time for the body adapt to that, to adapt to that. Correct. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, biochemically, um, you know, just once the insulin is down, you know, we're, we're, you know, uh, we're, we're producing ketones and so forth. And we can, we can, um, uh, you know, mobilize this energy. And this is where like intermittent fasting comes in, you know, you're just waiting out the clock on insulin. And uh, a lot of people will feel a lot better, they'll, they'll time their workouts. So it's sort of at the, you know, the tail end of that sort of uh, 16 to 24 hour clock. And they, and they work out there, and then they have like a big meal afterwards. Uh, and generally, people feel better while they're doing that. And they'll have one fasting day a week and so forth. Um, and so, and they, they generally do feel really well in that. I think that a lot of people are, are very used to being able to eat a bunch of carbs and take some stimulants or whatever, and they, and they feel really good and they can go into a workout. It's, it is sort of backwards, um, you know, because I don't, I, I, well, I feel good all the time. I have a lot of energy, but, you know, I don't, I don't take a bunch of uh, supplements and things like that to make me have a lot of energy so that I can go work out. I go work out and I start getting more and more energy and I start getting more and more into it. So I have to have that initial initial, um, you know, impulse myself to get myself in there and going in the first place. But then, you know, once it gets started, you know, I really, I really do, uh, you know, just feel so much better and it just perpetuates itself. Um, but, um, yeah. And I, I notice sometimes as well that like, if I'll get like a, just a bit of, you know, carbohydrates or grains or things like that, like, it, I, like I said, it would just make me sore and it'll just make me a bit more miserable and I, I can't work out as hard. And, um, you know, eating, eating grain or eating carbs after a workout, you know, there might, you know, there might be some, uh, some merit to that. Obviously, you know, insulin is, you know, is anabolic. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're storing, uh, energy into your, your cells and so forth. But I think it's, um, I don't think it, it washes out as, as a benefit in the long run because you have, you have, um, bodybuilders and so forth, they go through a you know, bulking phase and then a cutting phase. Um, so they're just eating as many calories as they can, but they're, they're gaining a lot of unhealthy weight that they then have to cut later. And, you know, so they're not necessarily gaining more muscle than if they just did it the right way of just eating, eating meat the whole time. Like I, you know, when I'm, when I'm able to work out, I mean, I, I look like I work out, but I literally haven't been in the gym in two months, but my body is maintained just, just by diet. And when I, when I do work out, I you know get a lot of benefit from that. I, was, you know, wasn't able to work out for just, you know, nearly a year with all the COVID lockdowns and gym closures and so forth. And I was just really antsy at the end of that. And so I was just like, right, I'm going to get back in and I'm going to go back to my old lifting schedule when I was playing and uh, at least four days a week, if not, you know, five or six. And, um, I put on, um, you know, a solid, I don't know, 25 pounds in a month. 
of just muscle. Like I had the exact same body fat percentage. And so I don't think there's any problem putting on muscle when you're, when you're eating a lot of meat, um, when you're eating carbohydrates, obviously this is, this is putting energy into your cells. So it's putting energy into your muscle cells. Certainly there's also putting energy into your fat cells and it's storing glycogen in your liver. It's also uh, storing glycogen in your muscles. This is, this is where we get marbled beef is because we're feeding them grains and carbohydrates and that's, you know, storing you know, that's, that's forcing, uh, the, the deposition of, uh, intramuscular fat apart from other things. So, you know, you're getting that as well. You may look bulkier, you may look like you're bigger, but a proportion of that is, is not lean muscle mass. It's, it's, uh, you know, intramuscular fat and so forth, which then you go into a cutting phase it all just goes away. And so, you know, is your, are your muscles going to be working as efficiently? No, I don't think so. Is it going to be as beneficial? You have like just a big bulky muscle that doesn't actually work as well. I don't think so. And so I think that if you are just giving your body what it, what it needs and what it wants to run optimally, I think you'll get much better results in the end. Uh, whereas if you're eating, if you're bulking on a car- bunch of carbohydrates, you'll, you'll look like you're getting faster gains, but they're not, they're not real gains. It's fool's gold. Do you think you're in ketosis all the time or, or do you, do you ever check or do you care? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't really, um, care. I'm, I probably am. Uh, I haven't, I haven't really checked, but I, I just think of things, things more in more of a broader scale. Um, you know, I know a lot of people get, you know, very, very focused on, uh, things like that. Um, but I, I really do think that we, as an animal, we are, carnivores. I just think that's, I think the evidence is very, uh, strong, uh, to suggest that. And so, you know, as long as I'm, I'm eating as a carnivore, as long as I'm eating in a, in a species specific manner, I'm just going to let my body do its thing. Uh, a lot of people try to say, well, you need to drink alkalized water because our blood is, you know, you know the pH is slightly alkaline. It's like your, your blood is going to be alkaline, uh, in, in a very specific range. Um, no matter what you do. And if you try to get out of, if you try to do things to get out of that, you're, you're really going to screw yourself up. You don't need to micromanage things down to, uh, you know, a level like you know, that level, um, unless you, you have some sort of disease state and you need to sort of, um, you know, and you're in the hospital and you're trying to, to correct that, but on a normal day-to-day basis, you shouldn't have to do that. And if you're, if you're eating naturally, you really shouldn't have to do that if you, if you're not sick. And so whatever my body is, whether it's in ketosis or whatever my ketone levels are, I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm sure I, in a, in a fasting metabolism, right. um, but I'm not, I'm not too concerned about what my ketones are. I just let my body do its thing. So, so you don't necessarily think it's unhealthy if, if somebody is in ketosis all the no. time. Okay. No, not at all. No, okay. no. Like, 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 well, you know, my argument is that that is our natural state that the so-called fasting state, you know, ketogenic state is our natural state. We call this a fasting state because I think, because by the time we were you know, able to look at our biochemistry at a molecular level, everyone was eating carbohydrates. That was a staple diet. And so they said like, oh, wow, when you eat, it looks like this. And when you don't eat for 24 hours, it looks like that. It's like, yeah, well, when you eat anything except carbohydrates, it also looks like this. You know, and, and, you know, as I was saying with the, you know, the wolf, uh, model, you know, studies back in 1981, you know, this, this is, this is something that, that, um, you know, we see in the animal, the rest of the animal kingdom as well, is that, you know, that's the primary metabolism that they're in. They're not in a, in a, in a, in a starvation state and shocking their system. It is the, I don't think it's a shock to your system. People, people do say this, but I think that's, I think that's predicated on the idea that we had it right about, you know, what we call these biochemical states, which I don't think we did. I think that we need to rethink that. I think we need to, to look at that. I mean, just look at humans in the wild, you know, you have the Inuits and so forth. They, they don't have plants to eat, even if they wanted to up in, you know, up towards the North pole. And, you know, I've I've read in different um, uh, excerpts from like explorers and things like that. in in, you know, colonial era that even the ones in sort of in the Southern reaches, that, you know, for a few months out of the year, you know, things would thaw off. And, and as one, as one guy said, you know, for these three months, surely they could live off the bounty of the land, but no, they don't. They still only want to eat animals. And they, he was quite surprised by that coming from a, you know, an agrarian sort of farm background. And so, you know, where are their, where are their carbohydrates? You know, I mean, they were living generationally, you know, in this ketogenic starvation state, 
they're doing just fine. I, you know, I heard one guy say, which was just appalling to me saying that, Oh, well, this is a, this is a, this is a short-term thing. This is a starvation state. And you, and you, you, you shock your system into doing X, Y, and Z. And I said that, you know, when you go into a ketogenic state, you're tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death. And then you get the benefits of starving to death. And he actually said those words, they came out of his mouth. And I was like, okay, you name me one benefit of starving to death besides you're now dead. And I don't have to listen to this nonsense anymore. And, you know, So, you know, when, when you're saying that, like, you know, you're, you're tricking your body into, into starving to that, you're tricking your body into this, that, and the other, and giving these benefits. I'm sorry, but you're not going to trick millions of years of evolution. You're not that smart. And if you were smart, you'd recognize that you should probably just do, you know, what evolution set up for you. And I believe that that's uh, eating as, as a carnivore. And, you know, if, if we, you know, you can't sort of hold these, they're, they're, they're competing, you know, conflicting ideas. You know, we're either carnivores, and that's an actual animal we are, or we need to have carbohydrates to drive our metabolism and, and we can't live for long without it. It's one or the other, you know? And so I think that the, you know, the great, um, you know, weight of evidence is in the side of us being carnivores and, and against, you know, ha having car carbohydrates like at all ever. Yeah. So I will say as a family practice uh, doctor that now I don't have everybody on carnivore, um, but I have never seen anything that makes such radical changes in one in, in mm. one's health as a carnivore diet. Now, again, I don't put everybody on carnivore. I talk to some people about it, especially those with autoimmune disease. Um, yeah. But um, like I said, I, you know, there are some people specifically those with autoimmune disease who I just had one here a couple of weeks ago came in as a new patient. Um, and he had um, psoriatic arthritis. And mm -hmm. he went to see a rheumatologist and of course they put him on, you know, the immune modulators and, and, uh, it helped some, and he had went to a paleo diet, helped some, and he just, yeah. he felt like that, that he could do more. Finally went to a strict carnivore, uh, eating, uh, you know, as well as organ meats and symptoms completely resolved for over a year. I mean, and, and had, yeah. had zero, zero symptoms. And so I hear a lot of stories like that on carnivore. So uh, from a clinician standpoint, point, it's kind of cool to, to hear some of those, you know, testimonials from, from carnivore um, type diets. But so I do want to ask, and, and I mentioned, or talked about this with Dr. Baker a little bit, but it's been a, a while ago. So if people are listening to this and they say, but wait a minute, uh, we thought that, that red meat, you know, causes colon cancer mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, red meat causes heart disease and yeah. eating all this protein. Isn't that going to be hard on my kidneys? Uh, comment on, yeah. on some of these myths that are out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. And, and these, these things have been, um, you know, said for a long time and that's obviously, you know, part of the argument on, on why we should eat plant-based and so forth. But, I think simply, you know, you look at, you know, you take things back to first principles. If we're carnivores, would that really make sense that, that, that our, our primary food source is just going to make us sick and, and die? Probably not. Um, you know, grass isn't going to, to give cows heart disease unless there's something really, really wrong with the grass. Um, and you look at the Inuits, you look at the natural, you know, people living in their natural state, uh, the native Australians, the, the Maasai in Africa, you know, um, Siberian cultures and so forth, tons of these things, uh, still existent today. Um, they, they live generationally only eating meat and, and very fatty meat. I talked to, you know, uh, uh, you know, local Aboriginals here in Australia and they've, I talked to them about this diet, talking about these sorts of things. And they all say, you know, the most important part is the fat. I was like, you're absolutely right that it is. And, so these people are living generationally and when they live on, in a carnivore state, a high fat carnivore state, they're very, 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 very healthy. And when they go to a Western diet, a, you know, any, just any Western diet, they get very, very sick. You know, when I, I was, I was a kid, I remember hearing that, um, uh, just on the news or something like that, that when eating a Western diet, native Americans were four times as likely to get, you know, all the major illnesses, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. And I remember thinking, I was like, well, doesn't that mean that the food is causing the disease? Because if they don't eat the food, they don't get the disease. And we eat the food and we get the disease. We just get it at a lower rate. And what's, what's a Western diet and what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not? 
and vice versa. Well, they didn't say it at the time, but you know, they were high fat carnivores. So that doesn't really make sense to me um, just on its face. And then whenever you have someone make a declaration, obviously I'm, I'm sure, you know, there is a lot of junk science out there, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in the medical world, there's a lot of junk science. And so people make conclusions, but what is it based on? When you actually read the study, you kind of look like, really that, that you, you got that from that. Um, a lot of these things, especially the one that colon cancer, that, that is one of the most you know, long surviving myths about uh, meat that exists out there. But you, you look back to the origins of these, um, of these studies, you know, there's a panel, they looked at, you know, hundreds of different studies, they cherry pick down, you know, the 27 or so that fit their narrative. And they say, wow, look, you know, red meat causes cancer. But even from those studies, they only found an 18% you know, relative risk increase, you know, these are epidemiological studies. They're, they're generally garbage in general, but you know, if you don't see like a 200%, you know, increase, then, you know, you're basically just like, well, this is just noise. There's, there's too many confounding factors. This isn't, this isn't going to be relevant. Um, when you, and people have redone these, these things later on and tried to correct for a lot of these confounding factors. And they've concluded that there isn't even a correlation between red meat and colon cancer. So there's not even a, co a correlation. Uh, as far as heart disease is concerned, yes, they say that, that, that red meat causes heart disease, but that's because they say that co you know, cholesterol causes heart disease. It is the causative factor for heart disease. Saturated fat increases your cholesterol. Red meat has a lot of, of both. You know, same with eggs. So these were, these were vilified early on, mm -hmm. but what happened, you know, in America after these, these USDA declarations in, you know, 1980 or so, we reduced our, our fat and cholesterol intake by 30%. We reduced red meat by 33%. We increased our fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively. What were the results? Well, for one, the, 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 the heart disease rate tripled. And so did the obesity rate and stroke rate and cancer rates, and diabetes and Alzheimer's, autoimmune disorders, all these things increased you know, exponentially. They almost didn't exist before then. Now they're the only things we treat. But you know, just specifically about heart disease, the heart disease rate tripled when we were as a population reduced our cholesterol intake by 30%. So you, know, you can't say that, you know, a causes B if you reduce a and B increases. Okay. If anything, you could say that it's, that it's protective. And in fact, that's what we're finding now. So all the big studies post 2015 have all, have all completely reversed the, this idea of cholesterol causing heart disease. In fact, they're finding in large studies with hundreds of thousands of people, you know, large meta-analysis. So for, there, was, there was one, you know, by the BMJ uh, last year, the meta-analysis finding that they found no association, not even association between higher cholesterol and heart disease. In fact, they found an inverse relationship between uh, cholesterol and stroke in that particular study. So then you look back, okay, why do we, why did we think that cholesterol caused heart disease? Well, there were a number of, you know, very poor epidemiological studies that suggested a correlation. There's no causative studies, none. There's no high level evidence to even suggest that, that, that cholesterol causes heart disease. And in fact, now we know again, since 2015, <coughs> that a lot of these things were, were done in a fraudulent manner. There was the, the seven nation study that, um, you know, Ansel Keys put out and this, this showed a parabolic curve of the more cholesterol, um, in a population, the higher the heart disease rate and, and it inc increased dramatically. That's, that's fine, but that's still correlative. That's not causative. That just shows, okay, there's a relationship here. Maybe, maybe we'll see how it's connected. Um, then that's a good, you know, grant proposal to then go on and actually do some real research, but they stopped there. They just said, yep, that's it. Uh, the problem with that is that another problem with that is that he had complete data for 23 countries, I believe 23 countries. And when you plot those, those on the graph, it's completely scattered. There, there isn't even a relationship. So by his own study, there, there wasn't, he, you know, he had evidence that there was not even a relationship between higher cholesterol and heart disease. So this was fraud. And you know, uh, JAMA reported in 2015 that there was a big cover-up with the sugar companies, how they, they had their own internal documents. We're talking about how they were paying off various professors around the country to vilify cholesterol and blame that uh, on heart, uh, blame heart disease on that and to, to protect their investment, which was sugar, which, which people were suggesting actually caused, uh, caused it. There's a guy, Dr. Yudkin, 
uh, in the UK who was arguing for decades that sugar was actually causing heart disease. You wrote a book on it and, you know, they would have debates and they would go back and forth. And then, but then when the USDA just said, yeah, cholesterol causes heart disease, end of story, you know, they, that, that was it. And it just discredited all these people because yeah, teacher said, and that's it, you know, no argument anymore. Well, it's appealing to authority. You know, you know, that's not necessary. It doesn't mean they're right just because they're in charge. Right. Um, yeah. But we're, now we we're know seeing that, that now we're seeing that now with COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, 100%. This, this is the yeah, way it is. Yeah. If you question us, then it's misinformation. You know, you can't have a scientific debate. You know, you just can't yeah. question us. This is how it is. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's it. And, you know, Hitler was an authority too. You know, we're right. supposed to listen to him. Right. I mean, he was in charge. You know, and, and we have the Nuremberg trials to show they're like, no, actually, you don't you don't get to use that as an excuse. And so, you know, and now we have, you know, you know, Jam also, you know, reported and, and people have written books, you know, Lustig wrote a book about this as well. Um, you know, talking about how, you know, one of the professors that was paid off um, by the sugar companies, I, I forget which one, but, you know, one of those guys that, you know, there's documentation that this guy was on the payroll for the sugar company to put out, you know, false and fraudulent studies. Um, he was named head of the USDA in 1965, and then all of a sudden the USDA starts starts you know pushing in the favor of uh, of the sugar companies and and against uh, cholesterol. So you know, so we know that's wrong, right? You know as, as you know you know phys physicist Richard Feynman said, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. So we ran the experiment with hundreds of millions of people in the US, now billions of people worldwide. We reduced fat and cholesterol, we increased fruits and vegetables, heart disease got worse. Okay, so that's wrong. And now and now we have like the actual studies and meta-analyses and so forth. And we have the evidence to show that the previous you know, epidemiological studies were, were crap. And so we know that's out. As to the, the kidney thing, that's, that's again, um, one of these things in medicine uh, that, uh, you know, what what is it based on? Well, a, a lot of things. I'm, I'm sure you've come across this as well. And since I've been you know digging into this sort of avenue of research, I found that there are a lot of things that we that we hold to be you know canonical in medicine that aren't really necessarily based on on uh, very hard evidence. They're just they're best guess for what we had at the time. We thought about this. Well, physiologically, this is sort of how this works. So I bet you this is and it's, it's the best theory at the time. And so that one gets taken off and it gets repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And then when you do the studies, we find like, oh, actually, it's a little different. And this is why we change. This is why you constantly have to be open minded in, in medicine is because you know, you're, you're going to get new information sometimes. So, you know, the idea you know, eat more protein, you, know, you have to cleave nitrogen off uh, of these proteins. Uh, these amino acids, and then you know you turn that into ammonia, turn that into urea, and you get rid. So if you have high urea, obviously you know this is a marker for um, you know dis you know kidney dysfunction. So you know the theory is is like if you have to if you if you're going to be trying to eliminate more and more and more uh, you know nitrogen, this is going to be hard on your kidneys because your your level your urea, urea levels are going to go up even though your creatinine is still low. That was a theoretical. But you know, they've done they've done studies since then. They found that no, actually, it it, it doesn't bother your kidneys at all. I've had friends, um, well, I, uh, well, different acquaintances that I've known, like you know, talking on um, different carnivore Facebook groups and things like that. People really reversing their kidney issues. Uh, one lady was on dialysis and just went, you know what, I'm I'm going carnivore. And her uh, nephrologist was losing his mind. He's like, you are going to kill yourself <laughs> if you do this. And she just said, no, I, I, I believe it. I believe in this. She said, after nine months, she came off dialysis. Wow. That doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, and um, I had a friend of mine who I, you know, I saw this and that was just sort of early on. And, you know, but there's so, there's so many things in, in plants and stuff like that, you know, everyone uh, in sort of the carnivore community talks a lot about oxalates, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. There's always one boogeyman, right? It was cholesterol for a long time, and then ketogenic people with carbohydrates, and now it's oxalates is, is now the boogeyman. But there are a lot of things in the world that are really bad for you. In fact, most things are bad for you, oxalates being one of them. But those obviously can can store up in your kidney. You can't use them. You have to eliminate them, and so you get a lot of you know kidney stones, and that it actually is hard on your kidneys. And so I was pointing this out to him. I was just you know. He was having some issues. His, I think his kidney function was down to about 19%. He was 35 years old. He had a four-year-old daughter. And he sort of started posting things on you know, Instagram and things like that, basically saying, like, I, you know, I'm not going to live to see my daughter graduate high school. Like this is I'm this is this is going badly for me. And so I reached out to him and just sort of told him some of the things that I was doing and told and you know, mentioned those those uh, 
uh, cases where these people had really, really flipped their kidney issues around. And I just said, look, meat's really good for you. Protein, here are the studies showing that protein doesn't actually cause harm to your kidneys. Um, here are the studies showing that, you know, oxalates and so forth in, in these vegetables are actually quite bad for your kidneys. You know, maybe give this a try. He just said, you know what, screw it. And like, I've got nothing to lose. Uh, three months after getting on it and his doctors losing their minds as well, he was up to 80% kidney function. Wow. And so, and that now he's, he's completely fine. Now he's completely healed. Um, so yeah, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, is it borne out by experiment, you know, in experiment, we're seeing that protein is actually really good for your kidneys and that, you know, eating more meat is of, of, of benefit. Let me ask you quickly about mTOR. Um, I've been listening to some podcasts lately, and and uh, Dr. David Sinclair keeps popping up, and you know he's a researcher, done a lot of stuff on longevity, and so his big thing is about mTOR, and mm -hmm. that mTOR you know is a growth accelerator, and so if um, your mTOR is high, it's going to uh, decrease longevity, and then he will say that animal products will increase mTOR. Um, so mm -hmm. what's your thought on mTOR and how that relates to eating a carnivore diet? Uh, so that, that's something I actually need to look more into. I haven't, I haven't dug into the mTOR side of things. Um, but, you know, just, just again, things sort of going back to, you know, first principles, you know, if this really is the way we've evolved to eat and, and evolved to live, then it, I, I, whatever our mTOR is, I think it's going to be optimal. Um, you know, we, you look at early populations and so forth, and they talk about how <clears throat> there's people, I mean, maybe 110, 120, or, or even older. I think the oldest Native American on record uh, was 137, hmm. you know, lived from like the late 1700s to like the early 1900s. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, they just, they just say that, you know, because they, they put, put great stake in, in old age and so forth. But you'll see this in, in all the different sorts of Native populations around the world and, you know, different continents and so forth. They've never spoken to each other, but they all have the exact same cultural tradition of lying about their age. I, I don't know about that. And also, you know, we know, we've known as geneticists for the last sort of, you know, 10, 20 years or so that, you know, genetically we're designed to live about 120 years. Meaning that if you just stay out of your own way and don't do anything special, mm -hmm. you should live 120 years. And so, so this is their, what they're saying, they're living to be 110, 120, 125, 137. That actually does line up with what we know genetically. And if you just don't poison yourself, don't smoke, don't drink, don't eat, you know, salad, you're, that you're actually going to reach that level. You know, Herodotus, uh, you know, the first uh, Greek historian <laughs> chronicled uh, um, an interaction between uh, the Persian emissary down to um, Ethiopia, kingdom of Ethiopia. And the Ethiopian king asked, asked the, you know, the Persian emissaries that, okay, what, you know, what is your, you know, emperor eat and what do your people eat? How long do your people normally live? And he said, then the Persian described making bread and growing wheat. And they said that, well, you know, our people would, would live, you know, around 70 years. And, uh, you know, the Ethiopian king sort of laughed and said like, you know, well, no wonder you live such short lives if you just eat dirt. And, you know, we only eat, um, you know, our cattle, we uh, eat boiled meat and we only drink the milk of our cattle and our people would live to be 120 years, sometimes more than that. that you know, that's bang on what we know as geneticists to be our, you know, our, our natural life expectancy, if you don't screw up. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, people dying in their sixties and seventies is, is very abnormal. I think that's literally middle age. And so we're doing a lot of harm to our body building up over the, over the decades, if you're going to be dying in your seventies. So, um, I do need to look into mTOR more. That's something that, that does interest me, but, um, I think just uh, on a macro level, yeah. you know, on a carnivore diet, whatever your mTOR is, it's going to be optimal. Yeah. So tell us about your daily regimen. Um, now there's <clears throat> probably nothing normal about your day uh, as a, as a neurosurgeon. <laughs> um, but if, if you're going to have a normal day, I mean, tell us, um, I guess I'm interested in what your diet is going to look like, like specifically, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner? And then if you work mm -hmm. out, I mean, when would you do that? What would you eat after the workout? Just kind of tell us a normal food day for you. Yeah. So, um, when I, I almost everything that I eat is, is beef steak. So okay. 99% of, of 
of what I eat is, is, is beef. And most of that would be like, you know, fattier cuts, like, like ribeye or something like that, or brisket, whatever. So something that has a good fat content, because I try to get about 70 to 80% of my caloric intake from, from fat. And that's, and that's sort of what you see in, in the nature as well, is that they get about that proportion if they can, um, uh, from fat. Um, I don't necessarily eat breakfast. I, I just listen to my body when you, get rid of carbohydrates and sugar, it, you know, it, you, you, you can listen to your body signals, you know, like if you're eating carbohydrates, obviously we talked about how that disrupts your hunger signals and so forth with leptin. Um, and so it causes you to overeat, but this, you know, I don't have that problem. My brain can see the leptin and I had to relearn my hunger signals. Actually, that was, you know, when I was doing this in my early twenties, I actually didn't realize that I didn't realize it was going to completely change my hunger signals. So I was just never hungry in the, in my, in what I traditionally thought of as, as being hungry. I would go days, I would go days without eating. And, you know, I was very, very busy. And so I didn't always have time to eat, but I, I just wasn't hungry. I didn't feel hungry as I normally did. And then all of a sudden I get home and be like, Oh, okay. I got, I've got some time. I could probably cook today because you know, I didn't eat yesterday. I don't think I ate the day before. Did I eat the day before that? I, I couldn't even remember. And so I was like, okay, oh, I definitely need to eat something, even though I don't feel hungry, but it tasted amazing. And so you have to relearn your hunger signals. Now I associate that with taste. And so if, if I tell uh, you know, my patients and, and you know, people I'm talking to about this, you know, if a steak doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. If it does taste good, you are. And listen to that because when the more hungry you are, the more your body wants those nutrients, the better they're going to taste, you know, because I can eat a steak start at the beginning. It's the best thing I've ever eaten in my life. I get towards the end of a very large steak. I always cook more than I think I'm going to want. Then that I, I, uh, it doesn't taste as good. I naturally just go, Oh, I don't, I don't really want to finish that. It's the same piece of meat cooked at the same time. Why does it taste different? You know, those chemicals, if they just made the same reaction, they should taste great the whole time, but they don't. And so that's my body telling me just naturally just to ebb off. So I listen to that. I generally don't get hungry in the morning. I usually just, you know, just get up, get ready and, and, and go to the hospital. It saves a ton of time. Um, I usually don't necessarily need to eat during the day either. So I would just go throughout my whole day, do everything I need to do at the hospital. If I'm able to do um, there's a hospital in, in, or there's a gym in the hospital. And so I'll, I'll, I'll try and go to that and do like a, you know, workout for a, however long as I have, and then I'll come home and I'll, I'll cook, you know, big steak or maybe two and, and, and that's it. And I'll just, I'll just eat all that and I'll go to bed. So I generally eat in, in the evening. I find that you know, even when I was playing uh, rugby, I always felt better uh, if I played on an empty stomach. And, you know, you think about, you know, fight or flight and, you know, rest and digest sort of thing. You know, if you eat a big meal, your body's just going to be, oh, okay, great. You know, let's, let's settle down here and let's just, let's just store and rebuild this energy. So I always feel better if I'm, you know, I'm going throughout my day and not having a, a you know, full meal before that. So, but if I'm, if I'm working out a lot, you know, obviously I'm going to need a lot more energy. I generally, if I'm, if I'm lifting weights heavily and working out a lot, I will generally eat twice the amount of meat that I would otherwise. And that's why I'm able to just stack on, you know, a ton of, a ton of weight. So, um, it, the difference in the time, but generally a typical day is I get up and I go, I drink a, a lot of water throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, after I work out, or, you know, if I have time to, or if I just come back from the hospital, that's when I have like, you know, a big steak or a couple of big steaks. Sometimes I'll, I'll be more hungry. And so like I had some steak left over now. So I was just sort of snacking on that. Um, but mostly I don't, I don't worry about like, you know, the, the one, one meal a day sort of thing. You don't need to, I don't think you need to do that unless you're eating carbohydrates and to wait out the, the, you know, the insulin clock. And so you can just eat whenever you want on a carnivore diet. But I find that I've, I feel best when I eat in the evening and I just go to sleep naturally. I feel great. Um, but I'll eat during the day if I'm hungry. And so what about like, if you're at the hospital and you, you are hungry and you want a snack, mm -hmm. like, um, I mean, what, what can you eat like at the hospital? If you, do you bring stuff with yeah. you to snack on or sometimes? Yeah. So if I, if I'm feeling like I'm like, okay, if I'm like, especially if I've been working out a lot, I'll, I might be like, mm, okay, I'm going to want to eat today. I just, I, because I can, I can, I can really mm -hmm. tell my, my hunger signals now. And so I think like, okay, I'm going to want to bring something. So, so maybe I'll cook a steak and just you know, chop it up into, you know, smaller bites like bite-sized pieces. And then I'll just put that into a, you know, Tupperware container and, and bring that in. Then I can just snack on that. Um, barring that, you know, the hospital cafeteria does have, um, you know, they can make, you know, bacon and eggs. And so like, I have like, a, they basically like know my order. It's like 10, I get 10 eggs and six, like full pieces of bacon. Oh, wow. And, um, 
And so they, you know, the bacon here is like this long, it's like the entire, you know, pork belly. And um, so it's not like, you know, the smaller pieces, big, big chunks of bacon. And, um, you know, and, and that'll be, you know, what my midday sort of meal, if, uh, if I feel I need it. It's pretty easy though. It's pretty easy just to cut up a steak and, and put it in a box and bring it with you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I usually don't feel snacky. If I'm, if I'm feeling the point that I, I want to eat something, I usually take that to mean that I should eat a meal. And so then I'll try to eat. Generally, I'll eat until I'm full. You know, if, it, if it's during the day and I don't want to like, you know, really sort of calm myself down too much and I want to work out later or whatever, I may not eat until I'm like completely full, but otherwise I will. Like at night, I, I will eat until I really don't want to eat anymore. And if I, if I do that, I find that I'm, you know, much more satiated for much, much longer. And so what would be your advice to people who are maybe interested in starting this type of a diet, this lifestyle, but they say, look, I can't, you know, you're eating a lot of, of, of beef, beef is expensive, you know, mm. I, I, I can't afford that. You, you know, like what, what would be your advice for somebody that to, to just get started with this? Uh, well, you know, you, it, it doesn't have to be beef, it can be whatever, whatever meat that you enjoy makes you feel good and that you can afford. Uh, you know, so if that's chicken, great, but I would just say go for the, the fattier cut. So if you're if you're doing chicken, go for like the chicken legs and the thighs with the skin on, maybe cook it in butter. Eggs are gen- generally fairly cheap as well. You know, just cook those in butter. I only cook in, in animal fats as well. Um, you know, like vegetable oils and, and you know, plant oils and things like that. They're, well, they're, they're, they're bad for a lot of reasons, but uh, they do, when, when they're outside of the plant, they're quite unstable and they, they can break down into, you know, reactive oxygen species and so forth that cause a lot of oxidative stress. Uh, and when you cook them, you know, as anyone who's taking chemistry knows, if every 10 degrees Celsius that you, you bring up a reaction, it doubles the reaction rate. And so when you cook with these things, you're increasing the reaction rate by millions of times. And so it, this gets, you know, quite, uh, you know, toxic quite quickly. So I only cook with, with animal fats, but you can always do something, you know, ground beef is, is generally very cheap and it, you know, tastes good. And so, you know, you can start with that or start with chicken, uh, anything that you can afford, really, it's um, more about what not to eat as opposed to what, what to eat, you know, just, you know, my hard rule is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. And so anything else is basically in bounds, but you know, like honey, it technically comes from a bee, but you know, really it's, it's a, uh, you know, nectar from a plant, but it's sugar. You don't want sugar. So don't eat that. Yeah. Um, dairy is okay. But I, you know, I find that, you know, like you get, you, you, some people have problems with dairy and, and um, should avoid it. And there's enough lactose in milk to, to drive your insulin uh, up as well, which you don't want as well. So that's something to be careful of. So whatever meat that you like and can afford is totally fine. So it sounds like you're pretty strict, but uh, I mean, mm. do you, do you cheat? And if you're going to cheat, what are you going to cheat with? Uh, what about uh, if you go out with your colleagues and I mean, do you have some, some alcoholic drinks? Um, you, you know, do you, do you, do you ever cheat? No, um, no, I like uh, just, just staying pure, just because I, I just like how my body feels, you know, if, if there's something slips in, like I'm, I'm, you know, there's something sort of on it, I'm trying to like sort of scrape it off. I won't get too anal about it, but I do notice that when, when something sort of does get, you know, on the food or whatever, like I'll, I'll notice a difference. Sometimes it's very subtle. And sometimes with a bit of grains or, you know, rice or beans or something like that, like I'll actually, my back will just ache. Hmm. Uh, like stabbing pain uh, for for four days afterwards, or you know, one cup of coffee. I'm sore, uh, you know, from my workouts for two days after that. That's that's really not worth it to me for a cup of coffee. And so I, I yeah, I, I do avoid that. Well, when you when you go out, you know, restaurants, unless you're going to a vegan restaurant, you know, everything has meat on the menu sure. or at least eggs. And so you just order that. You know, you order the fish, you order the chicken, you order the the steak. And you just say, you know, don't put any you know, seasonings yeah. on it. So you're, you're never yeah. tempted by a glass of wine or a, you know, n- nothing like that. No, I, you know, I, 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 I enjoy drinking, you know, I, I, I don't know many people who don't enjoy drinking, but I was, I was sort of um, had a bit of an advantage on that anyway, because I, I never drank during the rugby season hmm. and just, just for pure health reasons, I just felt yeah. so much better. And so, you know, when you're playing, you know, an 11 month, 11 month season, because I played 15s, I played sevens in the summer. So there's really only a couple of weeks, you know, between each season that, that I wasn't technically playing and, and my, my rule didn't apply where I, what I wouldn't drink. So, you know, I just, you know, just got used to just not drinking. I drink maybe once a year or once every two years. 
And then when I did, I would be like, Oh, why did I even do that? I had fun while I was doing it, but you know, like any, any drug, you, you don't feel great afterwards. Hmm. And so, you know, I just had a you know natural, you know, aversion to it. Now I really do because I've noticed that, you know, on the rare occasions that I do drink again, maybe, you know, once every year or two, I will, and I'll, I'll do it as like, you know, I won't drink beer or wine or anything like that because they have, you know, a lot more stuff in there that I don't want. If I want an effect like, you know, caffeine, if I want caffeine, I'm not going to drink coffee because it has caffeine, but it also has 150,000 other chemicals. You know, I don't want those ones. I want the caffeine. So maybe I'll take a caffeine pill, but I always feel better when I don't. So I really don't do that anymore either. Um, but if I want to drink, you know, I want, I want the effects of the alcohol. I don't want all the tannins and, and things like that that are in wine. And so I would drink maybe, you know, just, you know, straight uh, alcoholic whiskey or, or vodka with maybe like, you know, soda water or something like that. And that's a bit cleaner, but I've noticed that, you know, with my workouts and my energy levels and so forth, I won't recover from just one, one night of drinking, not, not going crazy, just a normal night. And I'm not hungover. I don't feel crappy the next day, but like, I will, I won't have the same energy. I won't be able to work out as hard for three full weeks. So it's only in the fourth week that I'm actually able to go back. Cause normally if I, if I go to the gym, I, it's hard for me to stop going to the gym because like, I just feel better and better and better and better the more I work out. So sometimes I'll, I'll be in there doing, you know, 20 sets of squats and 20 sets of bench and all these sorts of things. And, and I just have to, I just have to cut myself off. I can be there for you know, four hours or so, and I really don't want to leave. Um, so I have to, I have to be mindful of that and just give myself a time limit, but I can't do that if I've, if I've drank within three weeks. And so, you know, that's just not worth it to me. You know, maybe most people won't notice that, you know, because they're not doing those sorts of workouts. And so it's probably going to be very subtle for them, but for me, that's a, that's a big difference. And so that has to be, it has to be worth me taking a month out of my normal routine for, for me to want to drink. And that those, those occasions don't come up that often as far as, you know, a cheat day, you know, for the rest of the stuff, I think of, of that as, as not being very helpful just because, I mean, some people can do it, but you know, you're going to have a cheat day and then you're going to get yourself sort of addicted and used to this stuff. And you're just going to be craving it the rest of the week. And towards the end of the week, you're sort of going to be, you know, ebbing off and not really caring as much. And then you're probably going to, you know, eat all this stuff because it's your cheat day. So you can, you know, binge on it. And then you're just going to get yourself re-addicted to this stuff. So I, I think, you know, if you have a cheat day for smoking or drinking or heroin, you know, probably not a good idea because you're just going to keep yourself addicted to a substance that you don't want. And so I think that you have to sort of make a decision. Do you want this to be you know, incorporated as part of your life? Do you want this to be something you do or, or do you not? I don't. And so I think that, a, that, a you know, a cheat day would be counterproductive because yeah. there are going to be few people that can actually stick to that um, cheat day sort of paradigm and not, and not end up you know, going, going back to normal, normal right. diet. Normal so, so you've been doing, sounds like strict carnivore for how long now? Um, so now just most recently, I've been doing this since sort of like 2017, 2018, hundred percent pure. Okay. Um, and then very meat centric my whole life. And especially since, you know, the whole plants are going to kill you thing yeah. that at that point I was, I was on it for five years straight. And so, um, so you've been yeah. doing it a long time. I'm, I'm curious, you know, being in the hospital and stuff, I'm sure you occasionally mm -hmm. check your labs, um, you know, important labs, like inflammatory markers, maybe insulin levels. Um, I'm just curious how those look for you. If you, you know, want to share those yeah. or do you know those? So uh, well, I, I don't know the specific numbers offhand, but I did, I do have a friend of mine who's an endocrinologist and he was, uh, and he does a lot of functional medicine, bariatric yeah. medicine and so forth. Uh, and, and for 40 years here in Perth, and I've actually, you know, uh, worked in his clinic as well. Yeah. Just when I, when I've had, you know, the rare, uh, day off, yeah. uh, because I, I like this, I like being able to see patients one-on-one -on -one and really you know, help them and advise them, you know, to, 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 you know, sort of get healthy yeah. and avoid having to, to take a bunch of pills. So he was interested in this. I was talking to him about, you know, carnivore diet and so forth. And he, and he thought it was really interesting. And so, you know, he said, well, you know, you look really healthy, but you know, let's check under the hood. You know, do you mind if we, we do, uh, some tests. I was like, yeah, go ahead. And I, I, I figured they would be fine because I was confident that I was living, you know, uh, biologically, uh, you know, normal life. And so that my, my, all my blood should be normal. So he tested everything. He tests all my hormones, my, you know, um, you know, vitamin level, the mineral level, um, all sorts of different things. 
and he calls me up one day and he says, Hey, you know, I got your, your labs back and, you know, we should, you know, we should talk about this carnivore diet over a steak sometime because, uh, you know, we got your labs back and, you know, they're really good. So let's get, let's talk about them. And he said that and we went through, we went through all of them for like an hour. There's quite a lot. And he said that, you know, for your age, um, you know, for my age, that if we took a hundred thousand people off the street, my same age, that my bloods would be number one without a shadow of a doubt. Wow. And that, um, that he hadn't really seen that before based on that, you know, he started really looking into this a lot more himself. Now he's incorporated that into his practice. Like you, he doesn't necessarily, um, try to try to push this on everybody, but he, he recommends it to a lot of the, the people that, that are having, you know, yeah. you know struggling so forth, especially I, I understands autoimmune. the benefit of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, but he, he really advocates for it now and, and any patient that he can get, uh, especially ones trying to lose weight and, and reverse autoimmune disorders, he tries to get them on a, on a carnivore diet mm -hmm. uh, as well, just, you know, based on all these sorts of things. And, and, you know, so he's seeing in those labs, I'm actually going to um, be interviewing him on my, my podcast here in the next couple of weeks to talk about all these sorts of things, but seeing what, you know, seeing these people and seeing their labs, they're, they're improving dramatically, you know, for, you know, you know, men, their testosterone is going up their, um, you know, growth hormone is going up just for aging people because he does, he does, um, that sort of thing as well. Right, right. Um, those are improving dramatically. All their vitamin levels are getting, you know, normalizing. Um, they are, uh, you know, ones with like Hashimoto's and, and various, yep. um, you know, autoimmune disorders, you know, their, their numbers are correcting as well yeah, and well they're improving that, yeah. dramatically. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Um, well, let me ask you, I know you got to go here and got to go to the hospital, but, uh, so a lot of these carnivores, especially strict carnivores will talk about the importance of, um, uh, you know, eating liver and heart and all these organ meats, mm -hmm. uh, how essential is that? Do you incorporate that a lot in your kind of daily routines? I, I think I could, I could count the number of times I've eaten liver in the last 20 years. On oh, one wow. hand. Okay. So, yeah. So you, you don't feel uh, like I it's, don't have it's any. a have to. <laughs> I don't think, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I, it, it, it's perfectly fine if you want to do it. Um, but you know, you look at like polar explorers and so forth and, you know, one, one person that comes up in the carnivore sort of uh, community is, um, um, Steph, uh, last name is Stefanson. He was a, he was an ethanol professor of ethnology at, at Harvard and he was a polar explorer and he, you know, discovered a whole bunch of stuff towards the North pole, lived with the Inuits and, and learned from them and lived like them and just ate, you know, meat and fish and things like that. And felt absolutely fantastic. And he wrote a book called The Fat of the Land, talking about this. And you know, he was talking about his experience. And even, you know, even back in you know, you know, 30s, 40s, and 50s, people were asking him, okay, well, what about organ meat? You have to have organ meat to get your nutrients. And he was saying, you know, no, you don't need to do that. That, you know, they you know, while living up there for you know a year or more at a time, they didn't they didn't eat organ meat and the Inuits didn't eat organ meat. They would feed the organs to their dog, they would just eat the skeletal muscle and fat. As so we're saying, you don't you don't need to do that. Um, you can. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think that you have to think about it um, in in its sort of uh, natural availability. You know, you're taking if you're we have access to liver on a daily basis. We can go to a grocery store. We can just we can just live on liver every day. But look at it in proportion to a cow. How many hundreds of pounds of skeletal muscle and fat do we have to one pound? of liver, you know? So if you're out in the wild hunting, you know, and you're, you're getting a big animal, you're going to be eating that animal for weeks or months. And the liver is going to be a very small portion of that. And so, yes, it, it has a lot, it's very nutrient dense, but that can be a double-edged sword because it is nutrient dense. It can give you, you know, hypervitaminosis. So you can, you can get problems, uh, from that, you know, you know, the, the classic is like, you know, the polar bear liver, has, has so much vitamin A that it will kill you. You know, it'll just kill you. We see that sometimes people that are, which, oh, you have to eat liver, liver, liver. People are eating a lot of liver and, and they're getting, you know, problems from that. They can get, you know, you know too much vitamin A and so forth. This, you know, uh, hypervitaminosis A can drop your TSH, can drop your, your, your thyroid levels. And there's a lot of people in the carnivore community that are saying, oh, actually you can't do this long-term because you're gonna, you're gonna box your thyroid. Well, I've been seeing this in clinic and I've seen this in myself and, and my family members and, and uh, friends, we have no thyroid issues and my patients don't have thyroid issues. In fact, they're reversing their thyroid issues, um, but I'm not pushing organs on them. I'm not pushing liver on them. 
And so, you know, that could be, that could be an issue. And some people are just, you know, deficient in iodine It's very simple, but um, some people are saying, oh, well, you have to reincorporate carbohydrates and fructose or else your, your thyroid isn't going to go work properly. But, you know, there's no biochemical process that requires fructose in your body. There's none. It's not, it's not essential. And so I, you know, and it's certainly not for your thyroid. Um, so, you know, it's, um, you know, it's not, it's not something that you have to do. I don't think, I think that it's fine if you want to do it, but I would, I would do it in proportion. You know, I certainly wouldn't eat that as a majority of my calories to say the least. Gotcha. Okay. So as we wrap up here, I'm curious. Um, so you're, uh, you're rare in that you're a physician who understands the importance of nutrition, because it seems like we're a minority <laughs> of people out there, but yeah. uh, of the ones that, that are practicing this stuff, like myself and, and others, uh, you know, we do a lot of functional medicine, I do some anti aging medicine, you know, that kind of stuff, but uh, you're a neurosurgeon. And so that's, that's a little bit different. And so, um, uh, you know, with your career looking forward, what do you see? Uh, yourself doing as far as being able to incorporate, uh, you know, kind of some nutritional mm. medicine within your practice. Cause that's a little harder to do as, you know, as a neurosurgeon, yeah. how, how, how do you see all that kind of fitting together? Yeah. Well, I, I really like the, you know, the anti-aging and uh, functional medicine side of things too. So I'm actually, I'm actually hoping to, to kind of do both going forward and have, sort of having sort of two hats, gotcha. but um, you know, in, in just the neurosurgical side of thing, you know, it's, I, I think it's still applicable just because this, this helps our body work optimally. Um, and obviously with a lot of things that we deal with in, in neurosurgery, you know, you know, horses out of the barn. And so you, you're just dealing with, you know, um, you know, you know, spinal cord compression and, and degenerative spine and, and, uh, you know, brain cancers and things like that, where, you know, it's, it's, the problem is here and, you know, you can't, you haven't talked to him 20 years ago to you know, maybe help prevent that. And so you have to deal with that. So a lot of that uh, is, um, um, you know, important to, you know, you just have to, you just have to go in and do it, but you know, have these people, you know, with, with, uh, you know, radiculopathies, radiculopathies and so forth, they're having a lot of inflammation and pain. Um, you know, like, you know, like I've noticed getting rid of all these plant sort of things, like I, I don't have back pain anymore. I don't get sore after working out. And I've found that, you know, in my patients that are, are, um, you know, receptive to this, the ones that, that are cutting out carbohydrates and sugar and nightshades and so forth, or even going carnivore, they're significantly reducing, uh, their burden of pain, um, you know, from these radiculopathies. And sometimes, you know, we do surgery and it doesn't help the pain and, and that's unfortunate or, or they have some, some pain remaining and we, and we're looking at scans we're like, well, we don't have anything else to decompress. And so, you know, that you have to just go to a chronic pain specialist. And I think those ones in particular, um, benefit tremendously from going on a, on a diet such as a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet, because they're going to reduce their inflammation quite significantly and they weren't, aren't going to have as much pain. You know, then we have, you know, very interesting avenues uh, of research with ketogenic diet, especially, you know, like Dr. Thomas Seafried out of Boston showing that, you know, on a ketogenic diet, you can actually reverse a lot of cancers and reverse that disease process. You know, because again, you know, after the 1980s, you know, all the other diseases, you know, increased, but, you know, cancer rates have actually you know, increased by threefold. So, you know, something happened. And I, I believe that, that, uh, you know, nutrition has a lot uh, to do with that. And there's a lot of very interesting research involved in that. And so I think that um, even for, for those sorts of patients that are, that are dealing with tumors, you know, regardless of whether or not a ketogenic diet can help with cancer, it's going to make you healthier. Yeah, yeah. And, or especially a carnivore diet, it's going to make you healthier. And if you're healthier, you're going to do better uh, when you're fighting cancer. It's just as simple as that. Yeah, for sure. Well, okay. Uh, well, as we wrap up here, I always ask my guests if they could give us one health tip that would make us healthier today, what would you say to that? Yeah, don't eat plants. That's Very good. <laughs> uh, so, how can people get a hold of you? Or are you on social media? And you mentioned, do you host your own podcast? I just started one. Yeah. Okay. What, what's the called, name of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's called the plant free MD. And so that's okay. up on, uh, on, uh, Spotify. So, you know, it's coming up on the on other ones as well. It's just sort of waiting for those to tick over, but it's definitely on Spotify. Okay. It's coming on Apple podcasts and, and Google play as well. And then, cool. we'll uh, yeah. 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 And then I'm, um, uh, YouTube as well. So just Anthony Chafee, MD, on YouTube and same thing for Instagram, just Anthony Chafee MD. And I, I try to post, you know, if not every day, then, then, uh, then every couple of days and, uh, and, and just basically almost like a blog post. So, you know, I'm just talking about, 
you know, different things on why, you know, you know, you know, why, you know, not eating carbohydrates is a good idea, you know, why plants and, and different sort of fruits are still not a good idea. And so, you know, every, every post is, you know, maybe something, you know, douchey, like me working out or something dumb like that, which I hate, but like, you know, it was just a sort of to catch the eye, but then I actually talk about like real things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that that's um, uh, good if people want to go to that. And I, I'm more active on that as, as well. And I try to respond to people when they have questions and so forth as, as well as I can. Sometimes it's, um, it's difficult, but I always try to get back to people eventually. And then, yeah. And then you know, on YouTube and I, you know, I, I you know, have um, done debates and so forth with, you know, different doctors on, on the vegan versus carnivore sort of idea. I'm doing one in uh, next week uh, no, on the eighth. Um, basically arguing, you know, for and against cholesterol. I'm arguing, you know, that, that cholesterol is not a problem I'm going against you know, three cardiologists that are saying, no, 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 that's, we, we got it right. Definitely do that. So, um, so yeah, it's sort of things around there and, um, you know, have some different things, just talking about a carnivore versus a vegan diet and, you know, different sorts of, you know, things that, you know, vegan, uh, doctors and researchers say, well, these are the arguments for veganism and, you know, my rebuttals and so forth. So if people are interested in that, uh, they can check them out. Nice. Okay. Well, we really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, so uh, really appreciate it. So Dr. Anthony Chafee, uh, thank you so much and appreciate you guys listening and uh, have a great day. We'll talk to you next time.